be able to have a decoherence time is just as long as a single one. So it's really a technology issue rather than an intrinsic one. Sure. Is, sorry, thanks. Uh, is it possible? Uh, to, to, to uh, simulate the quantum computers, so you don't have any problems with the environment. I probably don't understand it very well, but uh, you can simulate quantum computers, but again, it takes exponential resources, um, so you don't win. <coughs> but one thing, one thing that people are doing at the moment is they are simulating small quantum computers to check that they are behaving <coughs> as we expect them to, using um, using some statistical techniques. So, how are you answering questions? Do you want to? Go on with your slides, are you happy to? Um, I've got a, a few more slides, but I don't mind answering some questions. So, um, how long until we like to have these things on our desktop as you know, the quantum computer Um, Probably, again, it very much depends on whether the technology can bootstrap and things like that. So, I'd say tentatively around 10 years. So do you envision these things actually being like microcomputers where people can go into the PC world and buy one? No, well I think um, in the first instance they will be special purpose computers which um, people can log into a server for example and use, use the computer remotely. I think as far as actually having them on desktops, it's like, well, is there any point? Do, do people want to solve MP complete problems using their PC? No, um, they don't. Think about like game physics with actual physics. That's what I was yeah. thinking yeah. about okay. physics problems and things. And uh, when you mentioned the protein folding, one thing that mm -hmm. a lot of gamers do with build their own machines is they do this folding the whole thing. That's quite yeah. a big thing. Yes. And I'm thinking, okay, computers come along and mm -hmm. it's a disappoint all the thousands of folding at home people. There's something there. They're wasting their time, you know. Well, yeah. So could they sort of jump onto another bandwagon and mm -hmm. buy their own quantum systems and carry on building it up? Would it be good at transforming matrices? Because that's one of the main. Sorry. In transforming matrices, is effectively pretty much yeah. what all three D graphics is doing. I don't know about. I don't know about that. I'm sorry. I don't know yeah. the algorithm for that process. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just to answer your question, I mean. I still don't think people will want them on the desktops in the first instance. I mean, I think that, yes. but, but maybe in the, in the far future, they might come as standard. If, if, for example, if the cooling technology improves at the same rate, then people are coming up with micro-cooled chips that, that essentially cool themselves now, down to very low temperatures without requiring refrigeration equipment. So mm -hmm. they, these might end up being, being co-processors um, that are generally available, but I think that's that's looking really quite far. Because at least three other people with uh, questions. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, uh, one at the back, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, how many of these machines would we need? I mean, for the mathematics of it, wouldn't it make more sense for the world to have one big one? <laughs> yeah. How many computers do you need? I don't know, but I mean, yeah. computers are linear in nature, so you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. Um, I think um, what, what I think will happen, sort of looking towards the future, is that people start building small systems and they'll start being able to model some very small toy systems. And then what will happen is people will start getting interested and there'll be more and more funding. And I think the funding will be directed at making a single large system rather than making lots and lots of small ones because I think the um, exponential increase you get by adding an extra qubit is much more important than trying to make lots of small systems. Actually, so, let's go to so, uh, yeah. Alex. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Okay, so it says, um, as, you, as you said, we can use the spin of an atom as a quantum state for a quantum computer. And um, as we know, electrons, protons, and neutrons consist of quarks, which can be at different quantum states. And so, can we use states of quarks for quantum computing? And one atom could be a whole computer in the far future. <laughs> so, okay, that's an interesting question, but I don't know enough about how quantum mechanics actually... Yeah. It can be a different carbons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one quark will consist of three quarks. Yeah. We can consist of two quarks. Two quarks can yeah. be different. Yeah. Once you figure out the center of technology, Alex. 
I think that's going to take another yeah. quite a few more generations because it's so much smaller. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing about this system is we understand quantum mechanics even though it's weird, and we're now actually starting to be able to apply it to to the two technologies. So I think things like that are, again, they might be able to be created into technologies in the far future. But I think so there's quite a few other questions. Adam, do you have a question? Yeah, is, um, is tunneling a problem? Um, well, tunneling can actually help um, because that's what the um, quantum system uses to link two states uh, between an energy barrier. So it actually uses that in the to get into a superposition in the first place. Um, in terms of can it also hinder you? Yes, because um, a system can tunnel out of a quantum state if there's a nearby system that it's coupling with, and that can be a source of decoherence. So. Yes, I've got two questions. One, you mentioned uh, microchips that cool themselves. Mm -hmm. Is that using something like the SIBO effect? Yeah, for example, yeah, that, that might be one way of doing it. There are also things like laser cooling techniques as well, um, where you can get very small on chip. And um, I've got another question. The, the decoherence, does that become fatal? Can you quantify how much heat it takes to, yes. to kill it? Is it, um, is it just KT? Yeah, it is. In a way, it's just KT because um, in a superconductor, essentially, you have an energy gap um, which protects your quantum state from the nearby energy states. And at any temperature which causes um, fluctuations larger than that energy gap, can excite your quantum state into a different state and that can cause decoherence. So what you want is to keep the temperature below that energy gap. Um, and in a superconductor it turns out that it's about 100 millikelvins around. I was going to take a question from Ben. I think then we should move on to some <laughs> okay. more slides. One thing that you haven't mentioned in terms of applications and so I was surprised about is hips cryptographic applications of quantum computing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's, why should, that's why we should run through some more slides, I think. It's not directly on that. What yeah. I wanted to yeah. ask is, do you know of any kind of restrictions on the technology imposed by governments who want to keep, you know, arms okay. control, uh, controls, that sort of idea? Right. Not at the moment, but I can imagine that is something that they might do. Uh, um, it is something arms control as quantum computing technology as well. Yeah, yeah, because um, yeah, it's got odd shit like Mercury and Mercury shouldn't exist. Yeah. Because there can still transform one problem that's actually cryptography into another one that looks yeah. like protein folding, but I just mm -hmm. shove it to the protein folding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we'll plenty of chance to go more into the questions and the discussion shortly. Yeah. Okay. And it gives us at least five minutes to. Yeah. Go <laughs> okay, so just um, the last sort of applications I wanted to mention was. Um, uh, oops was um, the security and uh, quantum computers, as everyone probably knows, the, the, the kind of killer app people think of is breaking codes. Um, so they can be used for this, but personally I think that some of the other NP complete problems are more interesting, things like protein folding and simulating quantum systems. So uh, I don't really kind of dwell on this too much. But one thing that is interesting is that they can be used for fast scanning of network traffic. So you can think about security applications, um, monitoring what's actually going across the network stream in real time might be potentially easier with a quantum computer because it's doing the, the, the pattern matching much more quickly. And then um, something that is very interesting but very, very new field is merging quantum computing and um, quantum information generally with AI, machine learning and neural networks. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But first I'll just show some examples of some applications running on, and this is, um, D-Wave again, and the reason I use these as an example is they're the only people who have actually got a working quantum computer with enough qubits to run some problems on at the moment. So here's an example of um, a matching problem. So it's matching a fragment of a molecule to a, to a, a larger database of lots of molecules and it's finding the right one. Um, and this, um, in this instance, it's kind of solving the Sudoku problem which you can imagine how this could be mapped onto an energy minimization problem because if you've got all nine numbers in a row, then that's the minimum energy configuration and it just has to do that over the entire problem space. Um, so it can try out different combinations in, in parallel and find the lowest energy one. Now, the thing about this is the quantum computer doesn't have enough bits to be able to show any speed up on these problems. The problems essentially have to be split into smaller sub-problems 
sent off to the 